How's it going, everybody? I will be talking about self-control. I'm excited about it, and I'm, I'm glad you're here. So grab your Bibles, grab your pens, mark it up. Uh, wherever We're going to get to some scripture, and we're also going to get into some real-life applicability when it comes to this topic. So in Galatians chapter 5, we see Paul talking about the fruits of the Spirit, ministering to those of why those are so valuable and vital to us as people. My, my take is that they all have individual value, and we probably all struggle in one area or another to a degree, but they all sort of hinge on the, how faithful we are in the Spirit. And one of those hinges, I believe, is self-control, and that enables the rest of them. So to start off, I want to ask you this question, how do you define self-control? How do you think self-control is applied in your life? When we look at the dictionary definition, by their standard, it's this. The ability to control oneself, in particular, one's emotions and desires, or the expression of them in one's behaviors, especially in difficult situations. I think we often look at self-control as something that we have a pretty good handle on, and then once our emotions get high, we get angry or really sad or just upset in general of one large event in our life or it could be accumulation of small events that we often lose our our control over our own emotions and we no longer control our emotions our emotions control us so i want to i want to get into what some of the ways and techniques that we can adopt in our lives to be better at it firstly I believe self-control could be defined as discipline, and that's a topic I'm extremely passionate about. I really like leaders that are heavy on discipline, and here's why. They don't really cut themselves any slack. Now, that could be a negative aspect for some people and, and thinking, well, I don't, I don't, I have, if I can't receive grace, then how can I better myself if I'm always feeling bad? Now, the point of discipline, I want to I want to stress that it's not to beat yourself to a pulp physically and emotionally and spiritually to where there's nothing left of you and you're drained. It's it's establishing um, internalized boundaries within yourself so that you can obtain freedom, freedom from all the negativity uh, that is directed from culture or from ourselves. And that's what true discipline is, because when there are guidelines, we have a clear path for us. And that's really the ultimate way to grow closer to God. So a couple of my favorite people are uh, to listen to on podcasts or read books. Uh, one of them is Jocko Willink. And I recommend picking up his book, Extreme Ownership. He is one of the most disciplined men, I think, I've ever seen, as you can tell from this picture. <laughs> he's got a pretty mean mug, but he's also a very firm believer in the fact that we can obtain extreme freedom through extreme ownership and extreme discipline. One of his mottos is discipline equals freedom. And the concept being that if we discipline ourselves, we can benefit so much freedom. You think of a bad day where I, sl I hit the snooze a few times, I got up late, I had donuts for breakfast, I skipped the gym, I didn't really feel productive, I didn't make my bed, I didn't clean my room, and before you know it, I'm just playing video games and the day is over. Does that sound familiar for uh, any, any summer day for a typical teen or high school or really an adult when you don't have work? <laughs> and that is the exact uh, negative effects from lack of discipline meant lack of freedom. You didn't really get much done in that day, and you really probably didn't feel better about yourself than when you did when you went to bed the night before. Now, the good day, you got a good night's rest, you woke up on your alarm, you worked out, you're you're moving for the day, you know, you have all these things accomplished, and it's already, you know, not even nine or ten o'clock, and then you're reading, you're having studies with friends, you're you're having good conversations, your your brain is actually more alert and awake. And then before you know it, you've got a lot accomplished. Now, that, in a sense, is the 
a, a lot of discipline led to a lot of freedom. You are now feeling healthier. You are physically more in tune. You're mentally more engaged in the day. And all of that to say, I think that's a model that we, we ought to follow on a daily basis. Now, one of the other aspects of Jocko is self-detachment. Now, when talking about extreme ownership, that's saying, I fail in self-control at times, but how can I better myself in those moments? All of these different concepts lead into self-control. When, when we have healthy discipline and effective detachment, we have a lot of self-control. One of the other books I've just gotten into is American Sniper. That is the story of Chris Kyle. There's also a movie and it's a very real and raw experience of a Navy SEAL. Both of those guys are Navy SEALs. I guess they're just like military people. <laughs> um, there, there are plenty of other good examples of leaders, but they have discipline drilled into their minds. So they effectively communicate that for people to understand. And that's what I like about it. And his story is very centered around how to control uh, the situation and how to control yourself in very stressful, life-threatening situations. So he knows what he's talking about when it comes to day-to-day -day things as well. So these are some real examples that I like, but none of these leaders can compare to our ultimate Messiah, Jesus. He has set the example of what a real, authentic, flawless leader looks like. And he has the most self-control of any man that's ever walked this earth. Going through some of the examples that self, of self-control that Jesus set, the first one being right when he was baptized, before his, his, missionary, his mission started for three years, he went out and calibrated his mindset by spending 40 days in the desert and fasted. Now, he had to have had water at some point, but no food for 40 days. That's insane. That's something we can easily read over and go, cool, but really think about that. I, I have recently experienced fasting and three days was a lot. And I, I, you know, I have a home, I have air conditioning, I have you know, all these different niceties and conveniences that Jesus was in the desert with nothing. He prayed, he was fully enveloped with the Holy Spirit, and he grew so much more in closer relation to God. And that's a mindset that even at a very small dose is the, the importance of fasting, but that's a lot of self-control. And Jesus was even tempted by Satan to make food out of nothing because he could. Yet, even toward the end of that 40 days when he was tempted, he still had the self-control to overcome temptation and overcome Satan because he recognized the bigger picture and the mission that he was on. One of my other uh, favorite things to think about Jesus is that he just resisted every earthly temptation. If you know, we step back and think of in our lives what tempts us, you know, you could go through the you know the labeled seven deadly sins, but lust, greed, um, gluttony, sloth, all of these, anger, rage, pride, we all have struggled, and I think maybe still struggle with one or many of those to a, a certain degree in our lives. And it's a result of lack of self-control. That's what I truly believe. So looking at Jesus' example, that should be incredibly encouraging to us, knowing that although he was made in the likeness of God and was with God, he was also just as much of a man and a human as any man that's walked this earth. To the core of temptation, the negativity, the 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 different fears that we may have. He still dealt with those, but he dealt with them in such a way that was the most holy example that we have to date and that we will ever have. That's what I find comfort in. One of the cool things about Jesus is that he had the power to conquer and control. If you think about it, he, he had the spirit of God at any time. He could have ruled, I mean, at one point, even the disciples and the apostles thought he was talking about creating a kingdom of heaven. He could have made a kingdom of heaven instantly and ruled and dictated whatever he wanted because he had that much power. But 
He chose instead to perform miracles, teach people a different truth that was radically changing their lives, and he showed grace. He had such a strong faith in the Holy Spirit that that was that everything that I just talked about he was able to do. And I think that the closer in relation we get to God, the more self-control we have. And they go hand in hand. So Jesus having set the example of self-control, what is the risk of lacking self-control? One of the, the scriptural references is in Solomon's Proverbs states it like this. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Now, if you think of a city, its whole protection typically hinges on that wall. That's its first line of defense. Once any sort of enemy or uh, foreign evil gets through that wall, there's a whole lot of vulnerability and risk. So if we think of our self-control in our lives as a wall, that we need to keep the perimeters high and sturdy, that'll change the way that we think about how we conduct ourselves. One example is Samson. And for those of you that were at Senior Teen last year, I taught a lesson on Samson. And there's a lot of value in his life. Check it out. It's in Judges. And it's, it's short, but it's impactful. But he lacked a lot of self-control. He was a very strong man with an extremely weak will. Although he was blessed with the Holy Spirit and God gave him strength, he often just turned to prostitutes. He turned to gambling, lust, greed, because of a lack of self-control. So that really puts perspective of nobody's really safe from having a lack of self-control. It is 100% a mental, a, 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 it's a gauge of mental toughness. And the only way you become more mentally tough is to do it. <laughs> but you have to put yourself in situations to stretch and grow in those areas. You know, when it's physically, when you're working out, you think you're growing mentally tougher by, uh, you know, doing one more rep or 10 more seconds, whatever it is. You're slowly mentally toughening yourself a little bit over the span of more and more incremental amounts. When it comes to spiritual toughness and self-control in that aspect, you're reading more. You're praying more. You are adapting your mind in the most holiest of ways. And I see Samson throughout his lifestyle. He didn't do that. He was very selfish. Another example is David, extremely valuable prophet that we have to look at. And he has so much wisdom, so much emotional and relational connection with God. He gave us all the Psalms, the majority of the Psalms that we have. And that's just a reflection of how in love with God he was and also how much he relied on God, praying when he was angry, sad, scared, of all of that. At such a strong leader, he even fell by letting his guard down one night and when he slept with Bathsheba. And even further, furthermore, uh, got her husband Uriah killed, one of his most trusted commanders. And I look at two of these men as examples of strong, one of the strongest men that we have an example in the Bible, one of the most dedicated prophets of God uh, and, and leaders and generals of God's army, Neither of them were, um, what's the word? <laughs> they were both vulnerable to lack of self-control. So it's a mental game that we ought to take control over so that we win. And to give you a little bit of a different perspective, there, there's a little bit more of a deeper grammatical way you can look at the word or the phrase self-control. And there are two Greek words which are translated as self-control in the New Testament. The first one is used in the list of the fruits of the Spirit, which we're going through, in a couple other spots, but it's pronounced egratia, and it expresses the virtue of one who masters their desires and passions. The second word translated as self-control in the New Testament is sophrosign. That one means soundness of mind and sound judgment. If we just go throughout our lives letting our emotions drive us, we're going to be angry. I mean, there's examples of people that I'm sure you're thinking of right now that are always angry, always just upset about the slightest things, complainers, groaners. 
I view that as a lack of discipline and self-control. And we, as the unity in a church, don't have a place to do that. When you think of it, that the person that is a stumbling block for others is such a negative influence. And it is hard to be around them. And when we find ourselves being that negative person, it's kind of hard to be around ourselves. We, you kind of feel sour and bitter and it's just not fun. That's just not the way we were intended to live out our lives. So, knowing what self-control looks like, how do we do it? How do we, as people of God, gain self-control in our lives? Funny thing is, there's a lot of example in Scripture of how to do it. The first reference... Again, if you have your Bibles, turn to them, mark it up, highlight. This is a really key few verses that we can turn to when we find ourselves struggling in self-control. The first one speaks on the struggle of doing so, which is in Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. And it says this, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within and they defile a person. Time out. That's a lot of negativity. That's a lot of harsh adjectives that are describing us as men. But I think it's something that we have to recognize. In fact, if you think to yourself when you hear that or read that, I'm above it. That doesn't apply to me. That, I, I don't think I could ever get to that point. You are putting yourself in immediate danger of becoming those very things. If we are arrogant enough to think that we are not susceptible to being put in the description of these negative things, then we very well are that much closer to them than we think. Whereas if we recognize, based off human history, all of the hate and the, the war and the violence, those were by people. We are all of the same human race. So if we recognize that, whoa, I could fall into that category, I need to be careful. I need to guard my heart. I need to make a covenant with my eyes like Job. I need to take every thought captive. Then I think that we'll have a better chance of not even getting close to these negative labels. And... Furthermore, when we hold each other accountable as brothers and sisters in Christ, it makes it a little bit easier. The struggle is prevalent right here, and it's addressed in a way that we can understand and we can see how we've related to in ourselves and other people. Knowing that, knowing that by nature we are easily corruptible as humans, there's also an antidote that's provided, and it's not hopeless. We're not... We don't have to accept that that's what I'm tempted with and that's what I am. That's not true. We are so much more and we were made to be so much more. God created us with spirits that are bold and strong and pure. And how to keep that, the antidote is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there are, is any worthy of praise, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is a very helpful and distinct reminder of, again in Mark, these things are going to come flooding into your mind and into your life. You better be ready. It's telling us here in Philippians that, this is the, the way to recalibrate your mindset. This directly ties into self-control. If we are self-controlling our thoughts, then our actions, our words, and really our spirit is going to be a lot more healthier. And I think that's why self-control is the key to mastering the other fruits of the, the fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all of those 
have to be trained within ourselves. And I think self-control is the starting point of that. The main challenge I want to leave you guys with is to train yourselves in self-control. Really make a conscious effort to better the areas in your life that you know you struggle with. You know the ones I'm talking about. We all have our, our kind of the elephant in, in our minds that we know that I hate addressing that. It's such a challenge for me. That's just part of being human. And I want you to really work on your discipline and your mental toughness. Because if you look at the apostles, Jesus helped them gain that in themselves. They had such a mental toughness that they went days without food. They went days on the road. They openly welcomed preaching against people that they knew were going to provoke them and beat them, imprison them, even murder them at times. But they had such a mental toughness and self-discipline that they knew and recognized the mission of Christ that that didn't really matter. Or it just didn't really affect them nearly as much as someone that would be not trained in those areas. They were joyful in prison. They converted everybody that they could because that was their clear mission. That takes a lot of discipline. And I think one of the hardest parts of being in this day and age is that we have a lot of distractions in our lives that pull us from that mindset and tell us, you don't really need to be that tough. You can recede into a cushy corner in your life that you are so coddled that you don't really have to be hard. You don't have to be disciplined. The danger of that is you look at people's lives that fit that description. How happy are they really? How effective are they in the kingdom of God? How, how good of a friend are they? So my challenge is that you all self-reflect, dive into the word, seek people and seek knowledge that challenges you and actually develops you, helps you grow, read with the intention of receiving and changing, and keep your minds open to what God is telling you. We, we look at this time in our lives where everybody's going through a different experience, but it is a global challenge with the coronavirus and with the riots and Nobody really seeming to come to an agreement of peace where Jesus gives us peace. God gives us peace. We have all the peace that we would need. If we all just focused on it, we would have a, a much better outcome. I love you guys. I'm praying for you and I look forward to seeing you soon.